All right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us for a virtual tour and discussion with Stonewall Farm on managing soil health, grazing, and specialty crops. I'm Nikki Fold, NOFA New Hampshire's Operations Manager. And NOFA New Hampshire is the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Hampshire. We promote organic farming, gardening, and land care practices for healthy communities. This is the last of six tours in our 2020 craft program. And if you've joined us for multiple tours, thank you so much. CRAFT stands for Collaborative Regional Alliances for Farmer Training. The program focuses on peer-to-peer farmer-led education and is supported by Farm Credit Northeast Ag Enhancement, Farm Aid, and the Cliff Bar Family Foundation. And now I'd like to introduce Stonewall Farms Executive Director, Julie Davidson, and Logan Haley and Cheesy from Ramblin' Farm. Welcome. Thank you for being here this meeting. All right, so let's take a look around Stonewall Farm. Bear with me for a minute. I'm going to uh, mute myself. I'm going to turn off my video and then share my screen. Welcome to Stonewall Farm. My name is Julie Davidson. I'm the executive director here at Stonewall Farm. We're a nonprofit agricultural education center located in Key, New Hampshire. And our mission is to teach and demonstrate regenerative agriculture to people of all ages so that we can ensure vibrant communities, a healthy planet, and um, as a secure food system. And so we work to achieve that goal using three main strategies. One is demonstration and innovation. The second is education and um, teaching. And the third is advocacy and engagement. And so our farm, which is about 120 acres, is about half of it is protected with the Forest Society of New, New Hampshire, and the other half is in agricultural use. We have about 30 acres total that are in production, and the rest is forested, and we have an extensive trail system here that's heavily used by the biking and hiking community, so a lot of people will come here to access the trails, um, but also to visit the farm. Our farm is open to the public, free of charge, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so people can come visit the farm, visit the barns and animals, and get up close and personal with a working farm. Um, the, this land has been a working farm since the land was originally cleared in the 1700s. The early settlers, the farmhouse was back that way in our gardens, and so um, they had cleared the land and they used it for a variety of agricultural purposes. In the 1800s, it became a working dairy farm primarily, and it has been up until this day. So um, it's been a working dairy farm for well over 100 years now. Uh, the last private owner of the land, Norman Chase, he had no heirs, he had no one to pass on the farm to, and so he was concerned that this land would go into development. It was in the late 80s at the time a lot of land was being developed for strip malls, shopping malls, that sort of thing, and so he did not want to see that happen to this land. Um, and so luckily there was a neighbor nearby who shared his vision, purchased the land, and had a vision of gifting this farm to the community. So essentially, you know, Stonewall Farm was incorporated as a nonprofit, as a gift to the Monadnock region and beyond. And so we carry on that mission today, 25 years later, um, doing a variety of activities here. Um, and our mission has evolved slightly because we're also working and focusing on um, teaching regenerative agriculture with a new partnership with the Savory Institute. And the Savory Institute is a international nonprofit, one of the top 10 regenerative organizations internationally that's working to restore the world's glass grasslands through holistic management. And so we became a hub with the Savory Institute in 2018. And there are, we're part of a global network of hubs around the world. Um, we're one of two right now in New England. And we teach regenerative farming and holistic management um, 
so that people, um, you know, can adopt these practices um, and accelerate the growth of regenerative agriculture throughout the world. But we also, um, so we teach the classes and we also teach what's called ecological outcome monitoring. It's a tool that farmers can use to um, monitor the land and changes over time. Um, and it gives both short-term and long-term feedback. So those are primarily the two functions that, that we serve as um, a savory hub. But we also have a lot of other programs. We have educational programs for children um, ages three on up to adults. Um, people can come and take a variety of classes here from tree identification to um, seed saving. Um, we have a, a variety of programs and courses throughout the year. And we also just welcome visitors to the farm. Um, our main crops are, um, we're a certified organic farm. And so we grow specialty crops, strawberries, broccoli. We offer a CSA um, throughout the year. And then we also ship our organic milk to Stonyfield. Um, and we use some of it to bottle and sell here. We have a farm store located here that we sell a lot of our products, but also a lot of farm products from local producers throughout the region. So today on our farm tour, we're gonna to talk about how we manage soil health here at the farm. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we started implementing a variety of new practices here at the farm. Um, and so we're gonna share those with you today, um, both what worked well and what didn't work so well, because sometimes that can be as valuable as what worked well. Um, and we'll start off looking at the dairy and our grazing program here. I'll talk a little bit about what things were like when we started and um, where we hope to go with that. And then we'll also look at our specialty crops where we've um, implemented uh, no-till and a variety of other practices here. So. Hi, we're in one of our pastures here at Stonewall Farm that we use for grazing. We graze approximately 28 acres of pasture here. Um, and for about the past 10 years, we've been using a, a simple rotation plan as um, part of the organic system of management. Three years ago, we started using adaptive multi-paddock grazing along with holistic management. And the key difference between that is, one, we have a, a planned grazing plan um, that is focused on the amount of recovery time for the plants, whereas with rotational grazing, we were simply rotating the cows from paddock to paddock after a set amount of time. Um, with the adaptive multi-paddock grazing, we'll adjust the paddock size um, and the length of time and recovery based on a number of factors, including our stocking rates, our density rates on the farm, but most importantly, recovery time for the plants. And so this paddock was grazed a couple of days ago. As you can see, the cows are behind me further down the field. Um, we divide this field up into sections and move them along. Each day they get a fresh piece, a fresh paddock to graze in. Um, Nutrients for dairy cows are different than um, beef cattle, um, so we want to make sure they have as high a quality of forage as possible. Um, some of the issues that we had had previously here at the farm was, um, and we, we're still continuing to um, fix these problems, but we had a high compaction rate here. And these fields are by a brook, so you can see we have a, you know, this is a riparian zone here. Um, there's water that runs all along the tree line here. Um, and so this field is very wet in the spring. And so when we bring the cows out, we have to be careful that we're not um, compacting it. Um, so we tend to turn the cows out a little later in the spring to allow that to dry. Um, and because of the compaction that it's had, you know, we've had difficulty with the growth of the grasses that we might be looking for um, in our fields and a lot of um, pasture weeds, things like buttercups and burdock. And although people don't like thistle, um, thistle actually can play a good role in your field. It um, has a long taproot that brings up a lot of nutrients up to the surface. So when we are managing the fields, we're not, 
managing for what we don't want, we're managing for what we do want. Um, and so that's an abundance and diversity of grasses, forbs, um, things like legumes, um, bird's foot trefoil, alfalfa are some legumes that you would like to have in a pasture. Um, along with orchard grass, things like that. Um, and so here, um, it's been, like I said, several days since we've grazed and the average height here, if you look at this grazing stick, is roughly around four to five inches. We, we try not to graze down any lower than that um, because we like to leave some of the forage behind. Um, and this is at the end of the season. Our fields have already had a frost the past couple of nights, and we also experienced a drought this year. So um, growth was very slow during the summer months. Um, and so the paddocks um, did take longer to recover. Um, and here we, we didn't keep up with the spring growth as well as we had hoped this year um, due to some fencing issues. Fencing is a really important part of a multi-paddock adaptive grazing system um, and we had lots of challenges with that this year so um, that held us up a bit and so some of the grass got mature but we specifically didn't clip it because when you have drought conditions that makes it harder to recover and so that that saved us a little bit um, when everyone else's fields were getting brown or just the grass that we mowed here this still was at least green and lush and growing although growing slowly um, so anyway, um, so we will wait maybe about 30 to 45 days, although that will pit, take us past the, the end of the grazing season. So we'll likely won't hit this paddock again this year. Um, it's been grazed about, I would say, maybe four, four times, four or five times this season with our rotation. Um, and you can see some of the... Um, the manure patties left behind, they're decaying pretty quickly, which is good. Um, and you can see inside some of the holes for the dung beetles, which are great. Dung beetles help bring the nutrients back down into the soil, helping to um, increase soil health and fertility. Um, with the Savory Institute, um, some of the work they teach, there are, there are four processes, four ecosystem processes that we're looking at and managing for here at the farm. The first is the mineral cycle, the second is the water cycle, third is energy flow, and the fourth is community dynamics. And so when we look at the mineral cycle, we're looking at how nutrients are recycled here. So you'll, you'll have some of this litter that's left behind, this, this brown litter. And so what we're watching for is, is this litter getting back down into the soil and recycling and, and adding more nutrients. Again, the dung beetles here, they're adding nutrients to the soil, taking the manure from the cows and bringing it down into the soil. Um, so those are two mineral um, nutrient processes that we're, we're looking at. Um, and then with the water cycle, we're also looking how water flows. The water table is fairly high here. It starts coming off the stream or the, the hill up there. And so there's, you can't see it in this film right now, but it sort of slopes and runs down and then it all hits the brook. So the water table is pretty high. Um, as long as we have a lot of ground cover, we don't have to worry about erosion. And so as you can see, there's a fair amount of ground cover and we don't have bare ground here, so that's good. Um, but we do have to monitor for compaction when the fields are wet. Um, we were able to, um, even though we were organic and rotational, we had significant compaction issues, which we've been able to ease by giving the paddocks more recovery time. Um, and so, you know, we're, wa we're looking at how water flows and moves here. Um, and we're also looking at infiltration rates. Um, I won't do an infiltration testing here today, but we've done it before in this field. Um, and you wanna look at how quickly the land can absorb the water. And that's important, especially in times of droughts, because it, if it can sink in and absorb quickly, the field will maintain that water um, during periods of drought and, and help keep um, your, your fields growing. Um, and then solar, we're talking about, you know, the energy from the sun coming down, hitting green grass and photosynthesizing. And we're turning that into a nutritional product. So for, or, or, it's a, it's food for the cows. And so here, um, 
you know, you want as much green grass growing as possible. Um, and so, you know, that's our, that's our goal here. And then community dynamics, we're just looking at the entire system here, the animals, the plants, and how they're all interacting with each other. So we're looking to have a diversity um, of um, plants and animals in the field, um, bringing nature back into farming. That's essentially what we're trying to do, create a natural habitat, um, because they all play a different role in helping each other. Another um, tool that we use, and it's a tool that we use to monitor the land and the changes over time um, to evaluate our land management, is it working or not, is something called ecological outcome monitoring. And we are just learning that process now, and we'll be teaching that to other farmers so they can also use it as a tool um, to monitor changes on their land. And what's nice about it is that it has both short-term and long-term indicators, so it can give, on the short-term, the farmer live, real-time feedback, um, whereas a soil test, that might be more of a lagging indicator, so um, that, that has changes that are monitored over long term. Um, and so some of the short term indicators that we're looking at are things like, is there any erosion? Um, what is the canopy abundance on the land? You know, is there a lot of ground cover and how much of a volume of it? What, what's the height of the ground cover here? Um, we're also looking at diversity of species and also what are the contextually desired species and undesirable species like say buttercup. Um, and there are certain indicators that you can look for. For instance, if, you're, if your fields are starting to get overgrazed and overused over time, you'll see some of those um, key rear species start to disappear because they're very sensitive to overgrazing. Those are some grasses such as smooth brown grass, um, things like that will, will start to disappear. You may not see as many clovers. Um, for instance, um, white clover will thrive in an overgrazed environment, but you might not see as much red clover. And that's something we were looking to seed here, um, but based on the changes we made in our management practices, we noticed we had red clover starting to reseed again. Um, it's here in this pasture, but a lot of it has been recently grazed, so you won't see any of the red clover buds, but that was a nice um, thing that we were able to observe right after our first season. Um, so another indicator that we're looking at is litter decom decomposition in the field. And so um, here in this field, you'll see some of the litter. It's, it's on top. And if you dig down into the soil, you can see more of the litter um, as it touches the soil and it's decomposing. And, and here in a non-brittle environment where we have regular rainfall, it will decompose pretty quickly. And you can see it's brown. If we were in a brittle environment where rainfall is not regular, you might see this plant oxidizing and turns gray. It doesn't decompose. Um, so here in a, in a non-brittle environment, we're lucky. It's pretty easy to grow grass. It's pretty forgiving. But, you know, you can cause issues and you can have signs of overgrazing. So a lot of times people look out across the field, but what you really want to do is look down and see, is there bare ground? What's the volume of grass? You know, and we, we have pretty good ground cover and canopy here. It's not that high right now because it hasn't, it's been grazed recently. Um, but the litter is decomposing and incorporating into the soil, which is good. Um, and we've left enough um, post-grazing residual so that that will happen. Um, we also have good dung decomposition. Um, one of the farmers that works here, he used to work here years ago when we were continuously grazing the cows and we also had the horses in the pasture too and they would scrape the fields with the dung because it wasn't decomposing. It wasn't able to incorporate into the soil and so it's doing that really nicely now. So those are all good indicators that we're looking for um, and it contributes to um, the health of the soil and the fertility of the pasture. Um, and you know if you dug out a clump of grass you'd see a lot of nice aggregates around the roots and um, root growth here. The soils are pretty shallow here so our root penetration isn't you know that deep but um, it's got when you do you know har harvest a clump of um, the grasses here as we did last year you can see a lot of good aggregates forming and so there's a lot of soil biology going on as well. 
So a benefit of having livestock on the land is also that we can integrate it into our crop production. And so we have a closed loop system trying to um, bring as much fertility to the farm from the farm rather than bringing inputs in from outside the farm. So the cows help not only um, add fertility to the pastures here, but also our crops, which we're going to go take a look at now. So you can see how we integrate livestock into our crop production. We're here at the Stonewall Farm crop fields. We grow here on approximately two acres, a variety of specialty crops that um, are, we sell through our CSA as well as the local farm store. Um, and it also serves as um, a classroom for our various education program. Right now we have some children in our um, remote learning program here in the greenhouses. I think they're harvesting the last of our tomatoes right now. So you'll hear shouts of joy as they, they pick the last of the golden tomatoes. Um, but right here there are five key principles that we're implementing around soil health that I wanted to demonstrate right from this field here. Um, and so the first one is um, plant diversity. And so if you're used to seeing typical fields, monocropped fields, they'll look very different. It's uniform, it's neat and clean. Here it looks like a little messy, maybe, you know, like a COVID haircut that's grown out after a while, but that's sort of intentional because what we're trying to do is bring nature back into the crop field. So here we have some hedgerows and these were all planted as forage and food for um, pollinators and beneficial insects. And so we have a variety of, um, oh, I just think I saw a little toad or grasshopper there. Um, we have berries and um, all kinds of um, early flowering um, shrubs that are helpful um, for the bees that we have here as well as um, beneficial insects. And then here we have an insectary strip and it's a variety of annuals. It's been um, touched by frost this week, so um, it's not in its full glory anymore. But this insectary strips provides habitat again for beneficial insects, not only pollinators, but other insects that help eat some of the pests that we have in the crop fields and that's important. Um, it's an important bioconservation control that we implement here to keep the pests under control. Um, being an organic farm we can't spray um, so we rely on natural management um, systems like this and so we try to incorporate it throughout our crop fields and even in our greenhouses and so um, you know, we still have some pest pressure, but we have noticed that it's, it's come a little bit more in balance. Yeah, so in this field, we've incorporated a variety of plant diversity, which is you know, the first principle of soil health that I wanted to talk about. The second one is minimal disturbance. So we try to minimize the soil disturbance as much as possible. So leaving it intact, that leaves the soil structure intact. It leaves, um, doesn't disturb the life that's living there. And so we do that, we have these fields that are no till and they haven't been tilled since, uh, let's see, 2015. And initially um, the first season this field, this field lied fallow and we grew a barley cover crop. And then in the fall, we um, planted a winter no-till. And then the next year we planted our strawberries, which have been growing here for three seasons. Next season, we'll probably rotate them out with another new cover crop. Um, and so in, in with the minimal disturbance, you know, we've seen a variety of benefits. Um, we've seen the strawberries thrive. It's unusual to have three year strawberry plants. Um, and the soil, it does seem, the, the soil does seem to hold water longer, although they too were impacted a bit by the drought. The production wasn't as good this year, but it's hard to tell if that was because it was in its third year or if, um, you know, it's just the drought itself. Um, but the berries have been delicious, so we've enjoyed them thoroughly. Um, and another benefit of um, the no-till is that, um, you know, all of the insects in the, the soil biology remains intact. And so 
that's been really good for yields the, in the previous two years that weren't impacted um, by drought as much. Um, what we have noticed though this year in our fields is our brassica crops were eaten by ants. And because we aren't tilling, the ants have been able to come in and establish their colonies. And so we'll be looking at how we manage that particular um, negative side effect. So the third principle I want to talk about is a living mulch. So we constantly try to keep the soil covered. That's to prevent wind and water erosion. It also helps keep the temperature down and cool, doesn't bake the soil, um, and adds organic matter and feeds the soil and all of the microbiology that's there. So we're going to talk about that in our field that we cover cropped with rye last fall and then we crimped it in the spring. So we're going to go look at that field now. So being a dairy farm, we have access to um, a lot of nutrients that we can add back into the soil that we use right here from the farm. So in, in the background, you can see our um, compost wind rows. That's um, manure that we compost here on the farm from our fields, and we can use it to help grow our crops here. Um, and so that's particularly helpful for crops that need a lot of, that are heavy feeders. Um, and so, the, so that's livestock integration, and that's one principle of, of soil health that we're um, applying here at the farm. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to talk about was the cover cropping. And so this, um, this field that you're looking at was all cover cropped with rye and also um, some clover last fall. And so it grew over winter. It grew to a certain height when the rye, the seed head, um, achieved a certain height and then we crimped it um, with a roller crimper that we rented from our local conservation district and I believe that's available throughout the state um, and so we crimped the cover crop and then we um, hand sewed the transplants all of the squashes here into this field and what that did was it created a beautiful um, mulch that kept the ground moist you know throughout the growing season and that was particularly helpful this year with the drought um, it will add nutrients back into the soil as it composts over the year um, and over this winter. And it also keeps a nice clean mat for the fruits to grow on. A consequence that we didn't in, intend upon was how much the voles loved it this year. And we're not sure if it was just a season where the, the voles were, you know, particularly in abundance or if this is just, um, is something that will be ongoing, but we did have a lot of bowl damage to our all of our squashes and pumpkins, except for the um, decorative pumpkins. They didn't seem to like those as much. Um, so we'll have to figure out, you know, going forward, um, how we'll how we'll work on protecting the crops um, from the rodents, because otherwise this is a great system here. It um, Use, incorporates a number of soil health principles here, keeping the soil covered, adding more nutrients to the soil, um, you know, creating a soil armor that helps um, manage the um, soil temperature, prevents water erosion, all of those things that we're looking to do to create um, a healthy environment for the plants. Um, there's lots more that we would love to tell and show you. So if you'd like to come for a farm tour, we have them scheduled um, frequently throughout the year in the growing season. You can always visit our website to learn more information about our tours that we offer here at the farm. Um, and a lot of them are hands-on so you can get involved and actually participate in some of the growing projects. So um, sign up for our newsletter and keep in touch. We really appreciate you joining us here today and um, hope you've enjoyed the tour. And um, we'll talk again soon. Thanks. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm gonna change my view here. All right. Well, I thought that was awesome, Julie. Thank you for all of that really great information. And 
Yeah, I know that our tour um, was about 30 minutes, so we are happy to extend um, this talk for 10 minutes so we can answer more people's questions. So I see there are lots of questions here already, and um, please feel free to continue to ask questions in the chat. Um, so we'll stay until 8.10, and thank you, Julie, Logan, and Cheesy for staying on. That's really nice. Um, I also just wanted to share that Laura Andrews is going to post a link in the chat to a NOFA Farmers Soil Health Survey. Thank you, Laura. And this is a survey from the seven NOFA state chapters. So please save the link and um, fill out the survey to help inform the NOFA's work around soil health in the Northeast. And uh, we'll also email it to you. So <laughs> um, Julie, Logan, and Cheesy, do you have any reflections that you want to share before we go into questions? Julie, I think you did an amazing job um, giving the tour of the farm. As most farmers know, this time of year is when everything, especially in the vegetables, is kind of withering down. So you don't get to see it all in its full glory. But um, yeah, I think Julie did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. Too, thank you. Well, I'm going to um, just ask the first question. And then we'll, I'll go and uh, read out everyone else's questions. So um, what other specialty crops do you grow? I know, Julie, you mentioned a couple, but maybe you could mention sure. more of the gamut. Sure. Um, uh, Logan and, and Cheesy, would you want to talk about that since you're out there regularly? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So by specialty crops, we're mostly focusing on specialty vegetables. That's everything from heirloom tomatoes to peppers to winter squash, sweet potatoes, um, all the greens, kale and chard. We definitely, going into this next season, want to focus a lot more on high value um, lettuces and salad mixes. And then also for more like winter extension crops like radicchio and chicories and things like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. And also some medicinal herbs, we might mm -hmm. want to bring that into the mix. But those are only considered specialty because um, in the organic vegetable realm, we're focusing on like more unique varieties than you're going to find um, in a typical grocery store or like grown by um, industrial scale vegetable growers. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So... We have a question here. Does rotational grazing limit the amount of cows you can have? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't limit the amount of cows. Um, when you're developing your grazing plan, you look at a number of variables, and so you look at your stocking and density rates in the farm. You look at your available forage, and um, then you do. A series of, of calculations and that would determine your stocking rate. So some farmers find that they can increase um, the number of cows grazing on their lands. Others uh, that will discover as they go through that planning process that they do need to scale back. And so that's one of the things that we discovered that we needed to scale back. But we have a very small land mass available to us for grazing and so that was an, an important um, and, and that's a whole, that's an important part of the planning process and why there is a planning process with grazing. Um, and you'll, you'll establish that process, but then you'll have to adapt it throughout the growing season based on the growing conditions. So, so for this year, obviously we had to adapt, we had a drought. So, um, and, and that impacted, um, the amount of cover time we needed before we could go back so and, and graze the land again. Um, so it's not, I would never, I would not say that rotational grazing limits the amount of cows, but um, so it's the availability of the forage that you have available on the land, um, the recovery time that it's needed. So there's just a lot of under, other indicators to look at. Um, and so it's important to know that so you can know what is the carrying capacity of your land, and then what are your goals in your contact? What do you what do you contacts? What are you trying to achieve on your land? Um, and so that's another consideration as well. 
so. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Can you talk about some of the problems you face without proper fencing with multi paddock grazing? Oh, do I have to? It can be traumatic at times to talk about that. Oh, fencing can be, uh, it's such a challenge. And for us, we inherited a really old fencing system. It's, you know, a combination of high tensile wire and poly wire, and it's all patched together. And, you know, we jumped into, um, you know, the holistic plan grazing wholeheartedly and eagerly before we had the ability to really fix that. And so when we're adjusting our paddock sizes, we have to spend a lot of time fixing and adjusting it. Ideally, what we would have in our fencing system is the entire pasture or paddock would have um, a really nice, um, well-grounded high tensile wire system. And then we would just be able to move um, to interior wires with the cows, um, but we haven't quite been able to fix that yet. Um, and then we have a variety of terrain that we're managing as well, um, some gently sloping hills um, and just weirdly shaped pastures that we're working with right now, um, trying to um, figure out the best way to um, do a perimeter fencing on that and then move the fencing lines in the interior. So definitely if you can get um, a good handle on your fencing before you jump into that, otherwise you spend a lot of time in labor moving the fencing. But, but once you've got that down, then hopefully it's just a matter of simple moves each, each day. Um, or based on whatever your grazing plan is. If you have a larger plot of land, they might be on that plot of land for two days or three or whatever, whatever your plan dictates. And so you won't move them as frequently as we do. Um, so. Thank you. So the next question is, um, someone is wondering, how do you maintain the farm and soil during the winter months? Um, being in a valley, King gets cold and stays cold much longer than this person's home on the coast of New Hampshire. It, it, it does actually. I live about 30 minutes north of Keene and I, my house is at about 1700 feet and when I drive to Keene, um, you know, as I've done in the past couple of weeks, we actually don't have a frost up here, but I'll drive down into Keene and the bowl and the cold just sits there and, and there's already been some heavy frost there. Um, we have to be careful about um, turning the cows out on the pasture when the pastures are in that frost and free, you know, uh, freeze and thaw cycle that we're getting more and more frequently due to climate change here in the Northeast. The ground doesn't stay consistently frozen um, and so you could you know damage do a lot of impact so we do have an outside area where the cows can go outside on a daily basis you could also have a sacrifice area where you know the cows get turned out to on a daily basis but um, grazing um, especially with dairy cows it, it would impact the quality of forage that we would have come spring so we do have to be careful we don't um, produce a lot of our own hay or um, feed, so we are a purchase feed operation and we um, buy in most of the feed that we um, feed the cows during the winter when they're not on pasture and grazing. Thank you. And uh, Logan and Chidi, did you want to add anything from um, the crop side? I think, well, for this winter, we're definitely going to be doing a lot of occultation, um, which is the strategic use of silage tarps. And that's just a way to keep the soil covered and suppress a lot of weed growth over the winter in areas where we didn't have um, time to get a cover crop in. So cover cropping or occultation, I think, are really the way to go um, in the vegetable realm. And greenhouses, if you want to keep winter production going, the more greenhouses, the better in this climate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have another crops question here. 
So given your no-till system with the strawberries, how do you deal with weed pressure? Mm -hmm. um, so the main way we deal with weed pressure is we do a lot of heavy mulching, typically with either hay or straw. Um, we want to experiment more with living mulches. We've done this before on our old homestead with creeping thyme. Um, and that has worked really nicely. Um, the fact that the strawberries can lay on the thyme and um, I don't know, do you want to expand more on that? Yeah, so Dr. Elaine Ingham, who is the major soil microbiologist and is also one of our um, primary inspirations and, and teachers, is doing a lot of research on these perennial cover plants that are low growing, don't compete with the crop, but are very um, great competitors with weeds, both in the pathway and even in the beds. So that's potentially something we want to do more experimentation with. Um, creeping time is the, is the only one we are currently like familiar with and we have actually seen work, but I know they're doing a lot of research at Soil Food Web Inc. over um, a wide variety of species you can use. And then of course the other option is the standard um, kind of landscape fabric um, raised beds with landscape fabric and holes burned in for individual strawberry plants. And in our experience, that also works incredibly well. Um, we really don't like plastic mulch, but we think that um, landscape fabric is a really sustainable solution for keeping your weed pressure down and keeping your strawberries manageable. Um, so that's also something we're considering with uh, experimenting with more. Yeah, and one thing I'll just add, when we established the strawberry beds that we have now three years ago, we had access to a lot of wood chips, so we were able to mulch initially the walkways with the wood chips, which um, was a nice um, um, a bed for the fungus, which has grown in and, and done well there, so, but. Yes, there's so that, much fungal activity in, in the yeah. field amazing. I think the arborists are a no-till farmer's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So how do you manage crossover or, or overreaching perennials from the hedgerows and insectary strip? Mm. Hmm. I'll just say what, I'll just speak quickly and then I'll, Jeezy and Logan, you, you can take that one, but just when we established the head roads or the hedge roads initially, um, we used the lasagna method. So we um, put down a lot of cardboard and then um, compost and then the wood chips. And so we actually built up a bed. And um, so the hedge roads haven't really grown into our crop fields. Um, we do have to weed the hedgerow bed itself. Um, that we have there. Um, and then the um, insectary strips are mostly annuals, so they haven't grown and spread, but I have, I don't have experience with perennial um, insectary strips. So I don't know, what, yeah, Cheesy and, and Logan, what you would have to add to that. Um, yeah, I was going to say on, I mean, on quite a few farms that we've um, visited and worked on around the country, I've honestly never seen a problem um, with perennial hedgerows growing into the field, uh, especially if they are very happy in the bed that they're in and they're not like super aggressive uh, vining um, cane berries. Like I wouldn't plant blackberries in a hedgerow probably, um, but that's just from our experience in the Pacific Northwest. In terms of like perennial insectary, a lot of herbaceous perennials, you're gonna be going through once a year and cutting them back to the ground in the fall anyways. So there's really a uh, little risk of them growing into the beds. Mm. Cool. Thank you. So the next question is besides ants, what are the other downsides of no-till? You guys wanna take that? Yeah. <laughs> well, Julie talked about the, <laughs> the rodents Right. already, which is definitely more prevalent in the, the roller crimp system. Most of our experience is in a no-till market gardening kind of system. 
Um, so we haven't had as many rodent issues as the roller crimped rye. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the hardest things to do with no-till is actually transitioning your systems, especially if you're in a mechanical system or you're at a larger scale, it can be kind of harder to figure out those little nuances and switching over. Um, and in that case, you know, I, I suggest just starting small and then gradually, you know, um, expanding your no-till methods. And there's tons of different methods out there for no-till for different crops. Um, so yeah, what are some other challenges? I think our other major challenge we were talking about was just access to compost. Yeah. A lot of the no-till vegetable growing methods that we're familiar with incorporate a deep composting mulch system. And in that case, you really need high quality compost and a lot of it, especially when you're establishing beds. Um, for example, we were just helping out a farm client in Kentucky. We were starting a new, um, a new vegetable farm on pasture. Basically, we mowed that pasture down super low. We layered down a thick mat of straw, and then we loaded tons, probably like three, four inches thick of compost over the straw. And that is, um, in our experience, the best way to establish no-till beds. But like Cheesy was saying, when you're transitioning, uh, that's usually not an option. You're trying to go from a tillage system to a no-till. So uh, still doing the compost mulch is going to be useful, as well as the potential for roller crimper and the strategic use of occultation. Again, I can't recommend uh, the silage tarps enough. I think that is a... Valuable, valuable use of plastic just because they do last for so long and uh, can save you so much time and labor and can also really help warm your soil and surprisingly nurture a lot of the soil microbiology beneath the silage tarp during the cold months. And solarization can also be a quick uh, way to turn over crops. I mean, you obviously don't want to leave a clear tarp on your crops for longer than, you know, maybe a day. Um, but that is also a great tool to get a quick turnover. Thank you. Uh, so the next question that we have here, and I also wanted to say that there were a couple of people who had joined um, in the last like 10 or 15 minutes or so. And so we're encouraging everyone to uh, put your questions into the chat if you have questions that haven't been answered yet. So everyone's still invited to do that. And this next question is, where do you get your irrigation water? Mm. We have a well located right next to our crop field. So we're lucky in that regard. And um, we use a lot of uh, drip tape irrigation. So we're fortunate. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, if you're using rye for a cover crop, do those particles transfer into your crops? For example, this person says that they're celiac, so they can't have barley, wheat, or rye. Um, if they were to eat the squash, would there be rye contamination or concerns? Hmm. Um. So based on what I know about these systems, I would say no. Uh, I can't like 100% guarantee that because I haven't read any studies specifically on like crop residue, but that, yeah, really people, most vegetables are going to have residues of, of some form of like straw or, or bark or whatever it may be. And I don't think like anything can transfer over in terms of gluten intolerance. Um, but again, I'm not sure of any actual peer reviewed studies that have been done on that. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so let's see. There's a question about the Savory Institute. Mm -hmm. um, it says, uh, the Savory Institute has received some critique for perhaps overselling the amount of carbon that can be sequestered through holistic grazing. And I'm wondering what you might think about those concerns. Yes, um, so that's a really good question. And you hear 
I think more than anything about carbon sequestration, when you hear people talk about, you know, agriculture being a solution to climate change. And, you know, I would personally caution and I've also, you know, spent time with um, Alan Savory himself, who has talked about it. And, you know, if you're just looking at one singular outcome, which carbon sequestration is, you're not looking at the whole system. And so really what the Savory Institute is trying to look at is, um, which is why it's called holistic management, is, you know, managing the system as a whole. You cannot dissect and look at nature in parts. And if you're singularly focused on carbon sequestration, that's what you're doing. So I would argue that that's um, a claim that is, it, it, the Savory is, is being misunderstood. Um, they're not advocating in particular just for carbon sequestration, but looking at and monitoring your, your entire ecosystem. And in fact, the ecological outcome verification process, that's what they're doing. Um, we're looking at a lot of indicators and, you know, carbon sequestration is like just one tiny indicator out of many that we're looking at. So, um, I, it, and it's a fear of mine. I mean, carbon sequestration is a potentially really powerful solution, but it's not the only indicator that we should be looking at. You know, our, our goal is we want healthy ecosystems, healthy climate, healthy food. That's what we want. Um, and that's what I really like about the um, ecological outcome verification process is that it's looking at all four of those ecosystem processes that I mentioned earlier, like the mineral cycle, the water cycle, um, things like that, um, it's not focused singularly on carbon sequestration. So maybe I would argue that might be a PR issue that um, the Savory Institute needs to tackle, but I know that's not a singular agenda they're promoting. There are a lot of um, regenerative organizations out there and um, legislation that's out there focused on carbon sequestration. And so um, I guess that's just what I would argue both for policy and also practice implementation that we don't focus on singular indicators, but again, whole ecosystem processes. So um, that's kind of what gets us into this mess sometimes that we're in when we isolate and look at one indicator and not the whole living system. So it's a good question. Thank you, Julie. That was really yeah. helpful. Um, and I liked how you mentioned a couple of times in the video that Stonewall Farm is working to bring nature back into farming. I think that was an yeah. um, important insight. Yeah. So um, I have another question. And um, uh, Julie, you mentioned earlier in the video possibly seeding red clover, but then seeing that red clover was coming back and that you didn't need to do that. And I was wondering if you do seed the pasture at all and what you might seed for if you are doing that. Yeah, right now we, the only plans we have, we will continue with the red seed clover only because we have an NRCS contract that we have to fulfill. But otherwise we're just using our, our grazing techniques to um, get the results we want. Um, and so, um, you know, we're, we don't have plans to seed. Um, we don't spread manure on our fields anymore. When the cows are out there grazing, they're, they're fertilizing it. So, um, you know, we're not doing that anymore. That used to be a regular practice. So, um, yeah, so we're just, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep monitoring it. And again, I mentioned the ecological outcome verification process, but you know, one of the things that we're, we will be tracking over time is, you know, are those key species that we desire, are they increasing on our land um, or are they decreasing? And so that will give us real time feedback on, you know, are our grazing practices working? You know, do we need to adjust our grazing plan? Is something not working? So that gives us real time immediate feedback. Um, whereas uh, we do plan on sending some soil tests, soil samples to the Cornell lab. They 
look at some indicators and actually um, Cheesy and Logan were telling me about another one that looks at the soil biology. So we'll, we'll look at that as well. But um, I think that, um, yeah, so anyway. <laughs> Hi, if I could just butt in, I just, I yeah. think that was really amazing how you mentioned the red clover just naturally um, coming yeah. back and reseeding itself because in my classes with soil food web, they have noticed that when they apply the soil food web technique with applying the biology to the land, they have seen red clover coming back as forage for the cows oh. as well. And I think that is an indication of the biology in the soil replenishing itself and getting the whole fo soil food web there, doing the proper nutrient cycling and creating aggregates and whatnot. Um, yeah, and, about the biological testing versus chemistry. Yeah, testing. and yeah, Logan brings up a good point about the biological testing versus the chemical soil testing, which doesn't really, um, it tells you a lot about the nutrients that are in your soil, but it doesn't really tell you what pool of nutrients that it's pulling from because they use like over 250 different chemicals to determine um, how much of whatever nutrient is in your soil. And so if you can get a biological test done that tells you, you know, the biomass of your fungi, if you have any nematodes or any protozoa in your soil, these really important parts of the soil food web, um, then you don't really know what's going on under there. All you know is you have nutrients in there or you don't. The chemistry. Um, so I think it's really important to, that we start looking at the biology in our soils instead of just what nutrients are in there. And Soil Food Web Inc. has started a lab offering. I mean, it's still in the process of development, but I'm sure very soon, Cheesy, along with many other students, will be certified to be able to accept soil tests and analyze them under the microscope. It's turning out that microscopy is one of the most valuable tools for a farmer, but I don't know, myself included, very many farmers that know anything about using a microscope. And so going into that realm of microscopy and into this newer realm of microbiome research, both within our bodies and within the soil, I think is going to be hugely revolutionary in the coming years in how we deal with both soil and human health and the way that they interact together. Yeah, thank you. That was really, really cool to hear about. Um, and I agree. So I have one more question and then I know it's eight o'clock and if people have other questions, we can stay until eight ten. And um, if there's no other questions after my last question, I'll wrap things up and people can go to bed early. Um, but my one other question that I had was also about crops. Um, so what pests have you seen decrease with the insectary strip and the hedgerows? Hmm. Well, one thing that we have seen decrease, we also have insectary strips um, in our greenhouses the past several years. And while we still have the um, dreaded tomato hornworms, um, they have decreased quite a bit. In fact, uh, a local, uh, it's called the Caterpillar Lab. It's, um, and they have a lab where you can go and visit all these caterpillars and it's a really incredible place that we have in the Monadnock region. And we used to be his singular source. He would come to our greenhouse just to get the tomato greenhorns. And he had to start going to another farm because um, that started decreasing. So, um, so that, was, that would be one indicator of um, you know, pests that have decreased, so. Yeah, I was gonna say that we noticed the kale and all of the brassicas, the Brussels sprouts, that have been in the field for quite a while now. I mean, that kale has been getting harvested off of almost all season. And the Brussels. And the, yeah, the Brussels look incredible. Well. There are no aphids mm -hmm. on these brassicas at all. I don't think I've found, I found none very, on the kale at all. Minimal. And I definitely think that's due to the insectary strips. Um, the parasitoid wasps play a huge role and those parasitoids, parasitoid wasps really love like white alyssum and goldenrod and all these different things that we see growing around the farm. So I think aphid pressure is a huge one, especially in the hotter months, as many of us know. So that's 
So you have the soil food web and then you have the above food web. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep both of those in balance. And by doing that, you keep your insect pressure in balance. You have your disease pressure balanced. And so just working, getting both of those, you know, balanced through insectary ships, insectary strips and biological yeah. tests and yeah. adding good compost and things like that. Because when you have that soil microbiology in the rhizosphere of your plant, you're growing healthier plants that in turn are not going to be susceptible to pest pressure. And that sounds kind of crazy, you know, when you're coming from a conventional paradigm, it definitely sounded crazy to me um, mm -hmm. at first, but then I experienced it firsthand and I, and I noticed that really that rhizosphere of soil microbiology is the immune system of the plant. Just like our immune system is made up of billions of microbes that we've yet to understand, the soil is acting as both the digestive system and the immune system of the plant. So when we're able to grow very robust plants that have strong cells, have strong cell walls, have a thriving microbiome on every surface of the plant, that is going to you know, work in hand with the above ground ecology of the parasitoid wasps and the aphids and the tomato hornworms and all the beneficial predators. So it's like, just like Julie has been talking about with the Savory Institute and holistic management can also be transitioned not only from regenerative uh, cattle grazing, but also into the soil food web approach. And like all of these angles are really what are part of creating a thriving farm ecosystem. That's not just um, a single lane monoculture, just thinking of one outcome or one problem. It's looking at all of them working together. Thank you. I was just smiling at someone's new comment, um, which was nice. Thank you. <laughs> so we have, um, we have six more minutes and we have a few more questions um, and hopefully we can get through them. So I'm going to ask these other two about the insect insectaries. Um, thank you, Tatiana, um, for offering to wave if needed. But um, so I'll ask this one first. Of, can you give some examples of plants you use in the hedgerows and insectary strips? Mm -hmm. Sure. Do you want me to go, or do you do you, do you want to go on that? Yeah. Well, you are more familiar with what y'all have sure. here. We we have um, a, a lot of variety. We also have, I, I didn't mention, um, what we call a conservation patch. So there was a large um, chunk of land that we um, planted with perennial native um, seeds. Um, it has everything from um, lupin to... Um, Oh gosh, I'm drawing a complete bank. Asters, I'm, I'm sure goldenrod's in there. Um, I could actually send a list. Um, that was in the conservation pack. In the insectary strip, we have trialed with the Xerces Society um, a number of different types of strips. Initially, the first year, it had a lot of cosmos in it. Um, and that's fine in the field, but we were using those and they're direct seeded in the greenhouse. So they were direct seeded in the greenhouse and it was actually blocking the airflow. So we went to shorter um, grass. We had things like, um, um, I'm drawing a complete bank now, um, but there were herbs like cilantro, um, uh, dill, um, I'll have to send a list. I don't know why I'm drawing a complete blank on that. There were so picture. many, it's hard to remember. Julie, I just pulled out the- arsenal. Yeah, okay, you have the bio. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, why did I just grab these? We're in the <laughs> Yes, and they're um, in the hedgerows. We, did, we do have a lot of berries, like we have raspberries, but um, there, were, there were other plants. Um, some did die back, um, so we have to replant them again. And we have actually yet to establish our beetle bank. Um, that's another um, permanent structure that would be in our field. Um, beetles need like a multi-year cycle. And so when you're tilling your fields every year, you're killing the beetles, but if they can have a habitat and they like, you know, to, you would like sort of 
uh, mound the soil with sticks, the Hugo culture type of thing, and then put grasses on top. And um, they eat not only weed seed, but they'll also eat some of the um, non-beneficial insects that would come into your crop field. So, um, so we have a list of those plants as well. Um, but did you do you have the list of, of what we planted? Yeah, in? yeah. There's just so many wild wildflowers, yeah. but wild bergamot. Um, the New England aster, bone set, which is also uh, amazing medicinal herb, um, blue vervain, also medicinal, yarrow is one I absolutely love, and uh, sweet alyssum is really our go-to, no matter where we are in the country, sweet alyssum um, on every farm we've ever worked on was tremendous. I saw another question about planting um, insectary inside the greenhouse. So especially in tomato houses, we always have sweet alyssum planted on the row ends and, you know, in a few spots um, in the lower canopy because alyssum is just the, the main attractor. Like not only do pollinators love it, but those beneficial predatory insects really love it. So um, if you were to start with one, I think that would be my go-to because it's also just super easy to grow and it's not going to like spread into your vegetable beds and become a weed problem. Mm, yeah, and there's a pretty blue flower that we grow. I, I don't know if it's a little bachelor button or a, a purple cone flower or straw flower, what that was, but the insect strips just look pretty as well. So they're aesthetically pleasing as well as functional. Thank you. I know there were a few more questions, but I think we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you all for your engagement. Um, and I know that Julie, you offered that you do have tours at the farm. So there's always opportunities that people can um, go to Stonewall Farm and ask more questions in person. Um, and I just want to share one more screen. Bear with me for a second. Right, here we go. Yeah, so this concludes our tour and discussion with Stonewall Farm tonight. And Julie, Logan, and Cheesy, thank you so much again for a great tour and for answering all of our questions tonight and also for staying a little bit later. That was really wonderful. Yeah, thanks for hosting the series, Nofa. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate it. It was really awesome getting to know, kind of getting to know everyone, not the same as in person, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so if, if you all did like this tour, um, you can support Nova New Hampshire by becoming a member or making a donation. Uh, we're also having a membership drive next month, all during November, if you're thinking of becoming a member. And the links um, to do that are up on the screen here. And we're also going to be making all of the virtual tours available in the coming weeks. So please check back to our craft um, web page on our website. And that's also on the screen here. And you'll be able to see all of the tours if there were those that you didn't attend that you are still interested in. And please also mark your calendars for our upcoming free virtual panel discussion called Why Organic Now? Linking Social Justice to Personal and Planetary Health. And that is on Wednesday, November 18th at 7 p.m. And we hope to see you there. Well, thank you again for spending your evening with us, everyone. Good night. Have a good Bye. one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. We really appreciate you being here for our program.